We also looked at ASL. This has uh, previously been mentioned by other speakers. So cerebral blood flow is, uh, was measured using two improvements in technique in ASL, specifically long labeling as well as transient type mapping. And we'll look now at how that uh, differed between MTBI and controls. So this is a group analysis. All these brain images are from the third encounter, which I mentioned was between 15 to 29 days. The yellow, as demonstrated in the color here, shows that there's less perfusion at encounter three when compared to encounter one and encounter four. So the perfusion goes down at encounter three and then increases at the fourth encounter at about 90 days as the symptoms are resolving. The right-sided graph is just meant to show you the natural evolution of con concussion symptoms over time. We, in these subjects, we do see a decreasing symptom burden over time as we reach the 90-day interval. So these findings of perfusion abnormalities, despite decreasing symptom burden over time, begs the question of whether the clinical presentation is sufficient to make return to play decisions, return to battlefield decisions in this population, or whether we actually need to consider the physiological element of concussion recovery as well. What was particularly interesting in this, as demonstrated in this, in this slide, is that when we looked at the same ASL data and analyzed it separately by gender, we found that actually these results were driven by changes in women in the top margin. So the top image shows robust reductions in cerebral blood flow. The yellow indicates the least perfusion in women at three weeks post-injury. And the bottom image shows reduced cerebral blood flow as demonstrated by the red showing decreased perfusion in the men at three weeks post-injury. This did not survive correction for multiple comparisons, but certainly has to be further investigated. We also looked at uh, volumetric analysis. So um, these results were less compelling, but we did find that all three graphs showed a trend towards negative correlation at encounter four between symptom severity score and whole brain volumetry on the left, as well as the left and the right thalamus in the other graphs in MTBI subjects. And the thalamus has been found to be uh, interesting in previous literature. So this, this, needs to, this requires further investigation as well. I'd like to present two case histories from our uh, subject population. So the first one is a patient of mine who was 49 years old. He sustained a head injury when hit by a car while bicycling. He did not have any loss of consciousness. His, uh, his recovery was characterized by actually, or his injury rather, was characterized by a severe period of retrograde amnesia as long as 60 minutes, as well as anterograde amnesia as long as 540 minutes. He had some soft tissue injuries in the jaw and the cheek. Indeed, a CT scan of the brain and spine done as quickly as two hours after injury did not show any acute intracranial abnormality in the brain and no bony abnormality in the cervical spine. The next step was an MRI. So the MRI showed an axonal tear, as demonstrated by the black and the red arrow and the surrounding edema. And this is a cube uh, 3D T2 flare sequence, which allows for high resolution image and is commercially available. So this sub particular subject had an interesting symptom evolution, beginning with headache, nausea, dizziness, and then um, was characterized by the onset of drowsiness, fatigue, feeling slowed down, some anxiety and depression accompanied his neurologic symptoms as well. He then felt he was having more difficulty concentrating as he tried to resume normal activities, found himself to be unusually emotional, exited the study, still significantly symptomatic and not recovered. And the MRI, of course, shows the axonal tear. So advanced neuroimaging was very interesting in this subject because the core injury persisted even after the edema went away. And you can see here the longitudinal change in the axonal shear injury is more apparent in the diffusion biomarkers of the axonal tear in the kurtosis column relative to the FA column in the middle. The next subject is a 38-year-old male patient of mine who had a head to ground injury from a bicycling accident. He did not have any accompanying loss of consciousness and had no amnesia, unlike our other patient. He had a completely normal acute head CT scan in the emergency room. We then did QSM, which did demonstrate intracerebral hemorrhage, as demonstrated by the red arrow. So what was interesting in this subject was that the CT was completely normal, indicating the fundamental uh, sensitivity problem with CT. So in conclusion, advanced neuroimaging sequences can be used to visualize structural and functional injury and track recovery. We know that resting state fMRI may reveal disruptions in brain networks, 
after MTVI that may directly relate to clinical presentation. We're finding that advanced diffusion metrics may be used to characterize and quantify axonal pathology on an individual subject basis, and arterial spin labeling, labeling has been very interesting to show dynamic changes in cerebral blood flow that is non-monotonic and may shed additional light on gender differences, which we increasingly recognize are present in response to mild brain trauma. We also recognize that more work is necessary to translate these findings into clinical imaging that is actually actionable on the part of physicians. And we are increasingly suspicious that neuroimaging may show pathophysiologic changes that persist beyond clinical recovery. I believe this should be taken into account when determining return to play and battlefield decisions. And we, we suspect and are concerned that athletes may still be vulnerable to repeat injury, even if their symptoms have resolved. So perhaps a combined approach of advanced neuroimaging with blood-based biomarkers may allow better stratification of MTBI patients in the future. We are concerned that average time to recovery may be longer than reported in previous literature. So what does recovery really look like at the end of this? Uh, phase one results. So we know that clinical recovery involves for the patient a return to play, a return to work, feeling neurologically intact, whereas physiological recovery may be better characterized with functional neuroimaging, whether it be ASL or diffusion kurtosis or functional MRI. And both of these result in complete recovery, but it's the partnering of these two and clinical translation that will allow us to take better care of our patients. I'd like to briefly mention future directions. So we have uh, just enrolled the last subject for phase two of the GE NFL Head Health Initiative. The data is now being analyzed and the results are forthcoming. The phase two was characterized by an additional four sites, um, some of which are present here today, and therefore a larger number of subjects and controls, as well as much more sophisticated neuropsych testing um, involving the Hopkins Verbal Learning Test, the Rivermead, the BSI, as well as other tests of working memory and processing and we hope to lead to more far-reaching imaging results with phase two. It's a picture of Hospital for Special Surgery where my concussion clinic is, and I thank you very much uh, for everybody's listening to this talk today, and I'd like to in particular to thank Luca, and as well as my research team, and the many people at GE uh, featured here, many of whom are present today, who have collaborated in this important research. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Tina, this is the same question that Dan asked me about adolescence. Do we know anything about risk in adolescence versus uh, adults? So we, a lot of the literature suggests that adolescents are more vulnerable. We know that the brain is, many aspects of the brain are still developing in the adolescent population, even though myelination is complete at a much earlier age. So developmentally, we think they're more vulnerable. And I see that in my clinic every day because I have a lot of adolescent patients, and I think uh, they're definitely more symptomatic. It takes them longer to recover. I think what's particularly interesting clinically is that adolescents are obviously in school, right? So they're learning and processing new information every day. So they're using these executive control networks and uh, processing functions of the brain. So they may well be more symptomatic just by virtue of the context that they're in. But uh, we think that developmentally there are changes that occur in the brain up to age 25, and this is something that we really need to understand better. Um, our, our study actually enrolled a large number of adolescents, um, but this is something that we need to do more work on. So it's a very important question. Thank you. couldn't resist the question about the psychiatry and the fact that you seem to be at greater risk if you had psychiatric disorders. Was depression one of the drivers of that or was it just across all psychiatric disorders? So depression was, major depression um, was actually an exclusion criteria. So, uh, but I would say, because I see so many concussion patients in the acute setting, that most of our patients, many of our patients have some level of dysthymia, and many of them who had some pre-morbid uh, mild anxiety are driven into very severe anxiety by virtue of their concussion and by their you know, removal from the activities of daily living, from the removal from work, from the removal from sport. So I think the psychiatric uh, con aspect of concussion is, is very poorly understood, and how that influences outcome is something that we have to get a better grip on. And our, our results were mixed. I mean, we found that psych, uh, you know, was an issue in terms of comorbidity or as a risk factor in certain encounters. But I personally am very suspicious about the influence from psychiatric uh, you know, diseases or whether it's genetics or, uh, you know, predisposition towards these 
um, towards these conditions of anxiety or dysthymia. I mean, what we see in our clinic is that the patients who take the longest to recover, ultimately we cannot uh, resolve their conditions without treating the psych issues as well because they're a tremendous part of this disease.